This episode of Back to the Roots podcast is brought to you by Byron Seeds. The folks at Byron Seeds believe organic requires a different perspective, plan, and approach. Organic isn't simply a different type of product or even a different way of farming. It's a different way of thinking, planning, commitment. It's a different philosophy on how to feed the world. Many won't understand, but the people at Byron Seeds do. We're owned by organic dairy farmers. We not only have the product, but we plan, manage, and execute organic. We speak your language, we share your struggles, and we laud your successes. Organic isn't a way of doing business, it's a community. We learn from each other. We're in this together. We'd be glad to talk cropping plans, management systems, the road to profitability. We understand what you're trying to do. We're farmers just like you. Visit us at byronseeds.net or give us a call at 800-801-3596. And thanks to Byron Seeds. Regional farmer updates are also brought to you by Soil Biotics. Improve your soil health naturally with Soil Biotics Soil Boost. This is a dry, humic product that creates a looser soil, improves water infiltration, and increases nutrient retention so fewer inputs are needed. Soil Biotics is currently offering a special fall discount program for Soil Boost from October 1st through the end of November. Call the office at 815-929-1752 or inquire at SoilBiotics.com. Hello, everyone. Uh, This is Mike Klein. Uh, We are doing the regional farmer updates year in review. Uh, We have the farmers on the line uh, that were giving us the updates throughout the year. So we're going to get started with uh, just a little bit of an overview of how their year was in each region. So uh, we're going to start out east in New York with Eric Byler. So Eric, can you uh, give us a little bit of an overview of your year? Sure, Mike. Again, this is Eric Byler. I'm in upstate New York, just about an hour and a half from Canada, um, snow country. So starting out the year uh, in the winter, we had a pretty good winter. Um, there wasn't a lot of freezing and thawing, which is, is nice for me. It's good for the cows without the uh, temperature fluctuations as much. So we, we stayed frozen pretty much most of the winter. Um, the challenge for me through the winter uh, was just, buying forage i had to buy a lot of hay last year so that's one of the challenges um but pretty good winter spring came early uh here in new york so we were in the fields pretty early and then we got a little bit a little bit of snow kind of it was a teaser two weeks we had early but guys were in the fields farmers are out uh working ground spread manure and then we had a couple weeks where it cooled off again and then um overall i would say crops went in pretty early this year um, then we had in June, end of May and June, we were extremely dry, almost no rain. Um, personally, I got my corn in a little bit later than some folks and it kind of just stayed stagnant for a while, uh, because there just wasn't moisture to, um, to take off. We kind of, we planted into really dry ground at the end of May and then June was really dry. Um, July and August and the first part of September, we were really wet. We had a lot of rain. Um, And if you could get your hay in, in those little short windows you had, um, there was a lot of hay to be made. So forage inventories in general are really good in my area, as long as you hit those windows. Some of the lower lying farms uh, struggled to get their hay off. um, So they had some poor quality hay. uh, And some of those guys are actually even a little short, but I would say most farms did pretty well for hay crop and corn also did really well. Um, w- once June and July came, our corn took off and grew, but it was, it matured pretty late. Uh, we had an unseasonably warm fall, which was a big blessing because my corn needed to ripen still. And so we got our corn off pretty late. Uh, I think I finished up mid October, I think second week, third week of October, we were just finishing up, uh, corn silage and snappage. Um, Again, but corn silage yields also uh, where inventories are really good in my area. So there's a lot of forage. And that was, um, I guess, 
a couple highlights this year. That was one of my goals this year was to to be able to produce enough forage um, through, by renting some more land and just get out of the cycle of buying buying forage. So we this year we should we should be fine. I shouldn't need to buy any forage. Actually, I did my inventories and I should have enough forage as I stand right now through next October. So that's a that's a really good feeling. And then another highlight. Uh, this year was actually getting my dry cows and heifers rotating through some sorghum sedan grass. And right now they're doing some late fall grazing through some uh, fescue. And so it was just, again, I'm uh, just a reminder, I'm transitioning to organic. So I'm getting cows. Uh, I have one more year on the land. August 2022, my land will all be ready. And I'm starting to get my cows rotating around and getting fence up. So that was a big highlight because... Uh, Grazing is really what um, it's what makes me tick. I, I love I love grazing cows. So getting those girls moving around was good. Uh, challenges this year definitely the wet was a challenge. Um, there's quite a few late nights because uh, we'd have just a three four day window to cram hay in. So we you know we bail like crazy and wrap bales kind of late at night. Um, and then the other challenge was just the mud this fall. Uh, we had about from mid September to mid October, we had a nice window where we didn't get a lot of rain. So it was super for making corn silage because we didn't have to play in the mud. But right mid October, it started raining heavy again, and the ground had been, you know, we had a lot of rain throughout the summer, and so we got a couple inches and another inch, and and so we're pretty muddy again. So trying to get manure spread and get the last few few things finished up has been a little bit of a mud mess. Um, and I think the other challenge for me this year was just uh, just realizing um, the state of the organic dairy industry. As you know, here in a lot of um, a lot of the farms got dropped up in Maine and Vermont. A lot of the Horizon dairy, sorry, Horizon dropped a bunch up there. And uh, so I'm, I'm really hopeful that we'll get a spot on the truck. But I also I also realize. Um, the reality and the challenge of the market. So, um, that's, you know, it's a little, that was a challenge just to, as it's, you know, I'm only a year away and just to kind of see all those farms without a home for their milk, uh, you know, makes me realize I might just have to keep going as I am and, and hope for a market. Okay. Thanks, Eric. Uh, next we're going to go over to Indiana and, uh, Marlon Esch, can you give us a little bit of a, an idea how your year went? So this is Marlon, and uh, so I guess I'm uh, just going to have to repeat some of the stuff that I just heard. Uh, we probably here in northern Indiana had one of the most perfect growing seasons that I've ever seen, and that just talking with a few old-timers in the area, I mean, they're all saying the same thing. They, We've just about never seen this type of, of growing season. So we started out the year a little bit dry. And it was worrisome. Uh, we had uh, visions of 2012 sort of dancing in our head, or, or I had in my head, and I was I was nervous. Uh, <clears throat> March and April were dry, and uh, then we did receive. Uh, we were getting a little bit of rain, maybe a quarter inch at a time, um, periodically, just enough to keep the top wet. Or I shouldn't say wet, just enough to keep the moisture there. Uh, Field working conditions were excellent in April. May turned a little bit dry. Uh, I remember moving fencing, and here in, in mid in mid May, a lot of my pasture fields almost looked like we were heading into July, and uh, I was concerned, very concerned. But uh, all of a sudden, a switch was flipped, and and we receive moisture as needed uh it wasn't an excess really but it was maybe an inch i i didn't keep track but i'm thinking maybe inch sometimes inch and a half per week so um things were 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 great in the spring and into the early grazing season our calving season calving season in the spring went very well without any uh hiccups and then in uh, mid-may this particular area here was hit by army worms. Now, it was sporadic. It wasn't every farm. It was just here and there. 
and uh, I was hit with them in my hay fields. But we were right, right, we were just ready for second cutting, and you could see that they they were stunning the growth, and so we cut second cutting a little bit early, maybe four or five days earlier than the 28 day cycle. So tonnage was way off on second cutting, but we were able to get rid of the army worms that way. So, and I don't know a whole lot about the army worms. You know, did the cutting take care of them, or was it did the weather? turn in our favor as well. I know that if you take away their feed source and you expose them to the sunlight, they're not going to last or they have to look elsewhere for protection. Um, and then in mid-May, the, the moisture, uh, late May moisture kept coming. It was perfect for hay and, and corn. We did fight a little bit of weed pressure in the corn uh, just from once you got into cultivate and we were able to get in there, get in the corn to cultivate on a timely uh, fashion. However, we cultivated and then we got some rain and that either uh, helped germinate new seedlings of, of weeds or it uncovered the the weeds that you had covered uh, in the last six hours. We, we saw a lot of that, that some of the old weeds that had been covered up were able to keep going because it was uncovered. Uh, we did a lot of hay in a day this year just because uh, of, of weather conditions and yet you know we had ample sunshine and all of a sudden they were calling for rain in the next two or three days and we were able to go out the timing was just right for for some reason we just hit those cuttings right where hey we were ready at we were at 27 28 days and they were calling for rain tomorrow or the next day and we went out and cut today and and bailed it up and wrapped it up by the evening and we are we're, we're scheduled to take four examples uh next week and I am excited to see how those how those samples are going to come back for us. The corn silage yields were excellent in our area, and we were able to get the corn silage off uh, early. We cut corn silage here on our farm on Labor Day, which I believe was the seventh of of September or the fifth, and that's you that's about two weeks earlier than normal for us. And so with that, we were able to get our fall seedings in behind the corn silage. We, we like to start our pastures and, and, and alfalfa seedings behind corn silage, and we're always struggling to beat that. So in our area, September 25th is sort of the cutoff date. That's, that's the, the seed people don't like to see you put alfalfa seeds in the ground after the 20th, uh, but up to the 25th, they're sort of uh, accepting of that. So we were able to get alfalfa seed in the ground by the 10th of September, and that really excited me. We did put in a, a cover crop of, of uh, some critical along with the seeding, and things were really hopping along here, and uh, that cover crop was growing well. We had a nice cover growing into mid-October, and all of a sudden, and, and this is one of the, the, the downsides of, of what I experienced this year, all of a sudden, it looked like somebody had sprayed Roundup on that field, and, and it's just from a distance I was looking at this. I was making road observations, per se. And the other day I walked in there and I seen that this is not, I mean, it, it didn't just die. I, I thought the cover crop had been killed off by something. And uh, I walk in there and they're like, oh, something is eating this stuff. And wouldn't you know it, we were hit by fall army worms. Uh, now we've had frost here in the last week, and that's taking care of the army worms. They're not doing any more damage, but they literally ate my new seeding of alfalfa and cover crop. And so there's nothing to do about this now. We'll have to wait until the spring to see what happens. But uh, the alfalfa was there at about 68 inches, and they stripped the leaves off of that thing. There's just it looks just like these teeny tiny skeletons out there of of small alfalfa stems uh doesn't look very healthy going into winter so we'll see how that how that uh finishes out uh as far as grazing we're we've had excellent quality grazing throughout the whole summer uh we did do a little bit of of summer annuals with sorghum sedan and not that we really needed it this year because of all the moisture but it, it was a nice nice little thing we had going for 50 cows, we only had maybe five acres, and it was just a nice little fit. But our permanent pastures have just 
just maybe once or twice that you could see that there was getting uh, a drought stress, and that was, believe it or not, in mid-May. Um, and then in the fall, it's just we've had tremendous growth. We've had excellent quality, and, and the milk is just really flowing right now. And and this is the first of November, and we are now just now getting ready to go into our uh, fall grazing pattern of, of oats and turnips. And uh, so we'll see how that that turns out as far as uh, milk and so forth. So it's been really exciting grazing cows this year. Uh, we were a few times why we were actually thinking that even during the summer in, in July and August we were thinking, man, we may have to jump ahead a little bit here through these paddocks because we're not able to keep up and. To, to get to the dairy quality forages, we may have to cut some for hay, and that's just unheard of for for uh, our area in August. Uh, getting back to some of the the challenges, we did put in a uh, new foundation underneath my bank barn. Uh, the one area was was it was a stone, the old stone and mortar type of foundation, and so we jacked up the 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 barn and put in a new foundation. That was a challenge. We did get it accomplished. And uh, the the other thing that uh, that was a challenge, uh, the, the last two weeks we have been hit with a lot of rain. And that in turn has, has created mud. <laughs> and we have just, in the last two weeks, we have just completely trashed our cow lanes. Uh, to the point where we're going to have to do something. I'm not sure what we're going to do. It, it's right now is not a good time to try to fix that. So it's going to have to wait until spring, and I'm not sure what it's going to. It's it's going to have to. Either we're going to have to pour some concrete, uh, or at least bring in a bunch of stone and fill up the the uh, cow lanes because it's not something that's that's going to go away. That's for sure. So those were the challenges. So and some of the highlights were we've we've. Uh, done some more tiling through some some uh, low areas that we had that were just sort of we just sort of farmed around these fields uh it was a it, it was a pasture field but it was a lot of the swamp grass was in there not a lot of high quality grazing material and uh, this summer again we were able to do some more tiling in those areas and we're we're looking at bringing those into regular rotations along with, with the pasture and, and maybe even some uh, putting some corn in there to, to completely renovate those fields. And we so this fall, we, uh, this summer, we did quite a bit of tiling, and that would have, that's going to add another, oh, another 10 acres to our, to our uh, farming acreage. So we're excited about that. We just, we've done the tiling, and it's, it's one of those things where patience is of essence here, uh, a lot of times when we tile something, then we like to go in and, and just rip that field up and get it going, plant something in there and really get it going. And this type of, of ground and, and type of material that's in there now is something that you just uh, you don't plan on getting a whole lot of crops off there in the first six months. And so we've done the tiling, and then next spring or next summer we'll go in and, and work it down a little bit, maybe just put in a cover crop, get the old grass, the old tough old swamp grasses to start decomposing and then the fall maybe come back with another cover crop and then the following spring so this would be the spring of 2023 we'll probably look at actually maybe putting in some corn so that's that's sort of the the highlight right now is is adding these acres to our farm without actually buying more acreage thank you marlon uh for the update uh your year sounds a lot like uh my area sounded you know this summer so uh n okay next we're going to go to uh wisconsin and uh corby gruen can you give us an overview yeah so i'm in wisconsin now but i was in uh the northwest corner of washington um this summer and i guess the biggest highlight would have been last year's bumper crop because we needed every bit of it for this summer um and another highlight, we got the cows out on pasture early, and they milked really well. Um, we got them out in early April, and uh, I had moved a bunch of base into April and May, and uh, we still shipped way over that. Like I think the one month, I think I think in May we we're eighteen thousand pounds over what our base, even though we I'd moved like twenty thousand pounds to it. So that was 
crazy and great, but um, then the rain just shut off. I think we got three quarters of an inch of rain in late June, if I remember correctly, and that kind of gave us a little bit of a because it was starting to dry out already in May, and and I'm sorry, late May is when we got that um, that three quarters of an inch, and it hadn't dried up to the point that it wouldn't absorb it because. I'm in a really heavy clay. So once it, it holds the moisture a little longer, but once it gets too dry, it just seals off the ground and really won't absorb anything. So we got a little bit, just enough to give it a little bit of a, a jump. And then it just shut off and we didn't get any more rain, um, like no rain. And then we got uh, record heats in July. One day it was 117 degrees. Um, so we were feeding pretty much full winter feed already in July. Uh, that heat really knocked the cows back on production. Like I said, I was way over my base in, in May and and way under my base the rest of summer because they just didn't recover from it. There was no pasture. I ended up buying a full semi-load of eastern Washington alfalfa hay, which usually can really uh help production and that just they ate it well but they just never recovered on milk um i only do grass so we make uh grass silage out of our first cutting second cutting we make dry hay third cutting dry hay and then if we get a fourth um we'll make some baleage and the first cutting silage was uh we got it put up probably a good week earlier than we did last year. Um, I think we got similar yields, but when we took a test on it, actually was a little, the quality wasn't quite there. I'm not really sure why. I think maybe um, a little bit of a cooler spring. And then we got into dry hay and I figure we got about a quarter of the crop that we did um, last year. So it was pretty devastating that way. Um, So, yeah, we fed all that extra winter feed we had from the year before, which is, was a bunch of baleage because my bunker was full. So we actually made a bunch of grass silage and then on another 30 acres, it wouldn't fit. So we made baleage. So fed all that out, fed a full load of hay. And it was just like, it was just the dust bowl out there. So um, I know we when we when we clipped our pastures, and I can't remember exactly what day that was, mid June sometime. Uh, we we clipped them, and then it just went ahead again with the heat, and it looked like we hadn't even clipped them. So, and then it just pretty much died on the stem. So, pretty crazy year, pretty abnormal year. I've never ever seen it that dry. Um, and the year before was one of the best years of my farming career there. So quite the contrast, uh, the corn in our area, pretty much if you didn't have irrigated corn did really well and, uh, non irrigated corn did not do well. So, and most guys didn't have enough manpower or water to water all their corn. So yields were typically down. Um, yeah, other than that, it was pretty uneventful. It was almost, it was a very short growing season. And now in, into September, I actually moved, I bought a farm in Wisconsin. So we moved around the 15th of September and yeah, it came to beautiful green grass. So that was pretty nice. So, and it's been a beautiful fall out here. So we're still grazing. Um, I think it's about done. We've gotten some frost last week or two and uh, they dropped in milk a little bit because I don't think there's quite what was in the grass as there was before Um, back home my dad sent me some pictures they do have really nice lush grass right now because they just got a slug of rain and we usually would graze till around uh, the 20th of November with the milk cows back there so we kind of would get a fall flush usually after it dried out um so there's grass back there again. Um, but yeah, so I got a whole new climate to deal with for next year. And uh, my feet are cold this morning. So <laughs> I'm a little scared of winter, but we'll see how it goes. 
Well, you better be ready for winter. <laughs> I'll try my best. So, I mean, how cold would your winters have gotten in Washington? Oh, we would get these occasional, we call them northeasters, so the wind blows out northeast and you can get snow and you can get down, you know, 10, 10 degrees, you know, rarely you get a negative uh, with the wind chill, but they just don't last long. Um, you know, they may, lie, may last a week. Snow usually doesn't last more than a week. Um, and then it goes back to your 35 degrees and raining, which some people don't believe that that's cold, but it's so humid and it's just a different kind of cold. It just kind of chills you to the bone. So it used to be, a, we used to get a lot more snow and storms when I was a kid. It seems like things have changed to where we get warmer winters than we, than we used to get. Another uh, thing I, I forgot to mention is that we ran out of irrigation water. So we usually irrigate about 40 acres of pasture and we irrigate out of a ditch. Well, all that water with the heat and I think the ground moisture just soaked it up and we hit about 15 acres and we were done with water. So it was just like a double whammy. Well, Corby, I appreciate your, uh, your update on the year. Um, and now supposedly a Mr. Hoffner will be joining us. So, um, this year has been a, uh, you know, part of the, part of the year has been good. Part of the year has been kind of not so good, but, um, we started grazing, uh, middle of April. Um, last year we grazed, we started grazing really, really early. I don't know. It was like in January or February, but we started middle of April this year and then summer came early. Uh, grazing was definitely shorter than what we would like this year. Um, the rains, um, have been spotty, hit or miss. I mean, like you can sit here as I say, rain on the property line, you know, uh, so there's been several rains for us that, uh, the neighbors have gotten and we didn't, but you know, last year it was the opposite. Um, you know, uh, crops, conventional guys, they've done pretty well, um, we have done okay for us personally. Um, Dobson's there a little bit further northwest of us. And I, he says that it's dry and you ride up there and he's got grass like waist high and he's whining about it being dry and he don't have grass and there's grass everywhere. So I think he's just full of mud, but that's just my opinion. But, but, uh, but you know, it's, it's just been one of them years. This has been hit or miss. Um, you know, uh, Everything is changes day to day, really, when it comes to all this stuff. But this fall, we have been grazing a little bit on some oats and tree kale. There's been some folks have some uh, problems with, I think a lot of folks cross country have had problems with the army worms. And um, I, heard, I heard several people talking about it. And I walked fields a couple of weeks ago and I found a big chunk of army worms in our oats. And I made a few phone calls, got Dipel, and um, but instead of using Dipel, I decided I'll just try some foliar. So I used a foliar mix that that we have used in the past, and it had uh, a lot of molasses in it. And darn, I sprayed it. A few days later, the army worms are gone. I don't know if they died or decided to leave. The moths or even disappeared. So I don't know if it just increased sugar bricks in the plants. I don't know, but whatever it did, it worked. And I did not have to use a dye pail, and that's great. And i um, really happy about that. Um, that was been, I would say that was been a, a really big success for us. Um, there were some other folks that sprayed a bunch of dye pail and, and sprayed, conventional guys sprayed some methrin-based stuff, and they got just hammered. I think they killed a lot of the beneficials when they did that really happy with that one uh, as far as mess ups this summer you know like i was saying earlier uh the rains were hit or miss i really regret we did not have our irrigation stuff going earlier and we kept on putting it off um really i may have mentioned this in some of the other podcasts i'm really i'm really grateful my grandpa and dad put a lot of money and infrastructure and irrigation back in the 80s 
and early nineties. And, um, that was really, that's really helped us out a lot. And I, I really regret not turning the pump on earlier this year. Um, that would have really helped us out, but, uh, well, we did irrigate a good bit, even though I didn't start as early as I liked. Um, and that's really helped out a lot, but you know, uh, it's one of them things and, uh, it's just, everything is changes day to day. Um, and as far as our cows, they've done okay this year. Um, uh, I've pushed grass more than I have in the past, you know, um, proteins are running really expensive to feed and we've grazed a lot more or tried to graze a lot more this year than I have in years before. And, um, they're doing okay. Uh, we're really, really stale, like incredibly stale. I've just turned 18 dry. I turned 18 dry the other day, sold for five, and I've got another <laughs> 20 to turn dry to do in late January. So uh, we're milking a double 14 parallel, and uh, me and the kid that works for me, he was all excited. We got done milking in 45 minutes the other day, and I'm like, you know, that's really not a good thing. It's great that we got done that fast, but it's really not a good thing when you when you look at the milk tank uh, weights and, uh, you know, we're not shipping much milk. But but they're all going to calve December, January, February. We're going to be milking a lot of cows come the $3 up, and, you know, we're going to be milking a good many when grass comes. So pretty optimistic about it. So, But anyway, that's what we got going on. And uh, sorry I was late getting on the phone call. Oh, you're fine, Chris. Um, so I just want to open it up uh, for you guys if you have any questions. I know, Eric, you had a question for Corby. You can go ahead. Yeah, Corby, just curious how you like Wisconsin so far and challenges on your new farm. Um, just from stepping into this farm two and a half years ago, I know it can be overwhelming, you know, depending what kind of setup you have. Um, just curious. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think we're loving it so far for the most part. I would say the first two weeks to 10 days were pretty miserable. Just, you're just kind of turned upside down. You don't have your routine. You don't know anything. Um, I went from milking in a double five herringbone to a swing uh, 14 and that was hard for me at first I was like I think I could milk faster in my double five herringbone until um, I kind of got a system down and now the kids and I can milk we're milking about five cows and we can milk in about an hour but at first it was taking me forever it's just it's just so different um, yeah but the, it's been a beautiful fall um, I went to school and Minnesota, so I do know the Midwest a little bit. Um, but yeah, it's just tons of pasture. It was like we got a fall flush of pasture. So after being pretty much living in a desert the last few months, then coming here was kind of refreshing and the cows are milking well. We bought the herd of cows here and then we um, hauled dry cows and heifers and one load of uh, milk cows. So I figured. <clears throat> having some cows that knew the system um, and just everything was so inconsistent. We needed one thing that was going to be consistent. So that was nice to have an existing herd of cows that knew the parlor, everything from there and the few that we sprinkled in caught on pretty quick. So I have a question for Corbin. I'm going to change the subject a little bit and this may be type of a, maybe a little bit more personal question, but so, so someone stepping out of their, their box and going to a new farm, a new region is something that has always intrigued me. And so I'm curious, what made you make that move if you care to talk about it? Yeah. So, um, I guess several factors, I, I guess one thing that would have made me a lot more brave on it was that I actually almost died about a year and a half ago. I spent, um, over a month, in the university hospital, they couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. And I think that changed a little bit how I look at things. I've talked about moving or thought about moving uh, for a long time. Um, and at the end of it, you can die at any time, no matter how healthy or how old you are. 
And so I think that had something to do with it. And then also I saw this place online. It just, it popped up on my Facebook account. Um, a guy, a guy that I follow shared it and I kind of showed it to my wife and she said, well, let's just go look at it. What's the hurt in going to look at it? At it. And we flew out here. In, uh, I think it was the 30th of April or something like that. And we liked it. And at that time it just seemed kind of like a pipe dream. Um, we had to get financing through FSA and that's pretty slow. So we, thought somebody would buy it before we even got to really even talking about it. So we applied for the finance in that next week and he had several people come look at it and it just, um, it just kind of kept going through the, the process and no one bought it. And all of a sudden there was a point where it was like, Oh crap. Like we actually <laughs> have to do this. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think, as far as why we wanted to move, I think I, I was renting my dad's farm back in Washington and it was about the same size. So this is 120 acres. That was 120 acres. Well, that's going to be worth well over a million or maybe even 2 million or higher there. And this place we got for 780 and we can't buy a house with 10 acres in, in our County back in Washington for that. So that was a lot of it we were renting a house, we were renting the farm and we wanted to have our own place. And now my dad can probably get a lot more for his place without giving me a deal too. And so, and then just, um, Washington is just becoming less and less rural and I like wide open space. And I had, we had a beautiful farm. It was hidden off the road, but everything around us was turning into five and 10 acre houses, big mansions and stuff. And it just wasn't the same. And, um, for me and, and yeah, so there, and there's a lot of other political and, um, regulation pressure, um, out there. Um, it's just, becoming a harder place to do business. Interesting. So and my most hat of my is friends, off to you, by the way, Corby. <laughs> What's that? I just said my hat is off to you for making that move and, and uh, <laughs> taking the bull by the horns. <laughs> yeah, we'll see how it goes. I'll, I'll, you guys may all need to call me in February when I'm freezing just for moral support. But um, I know some of my friends think I moved to the North Pole. But... <laughs> um, yeah, so it, a lot of it's about attitude. So just, we made the decision, and you got to like it now, right? So, so Marlon, I have a question for you. You mentioned that you did mostly hay in a day, and at what moisture uh, were you baling that? Uh, so I don't have a moisture tester except just what I visually see and feel, um, and and so we we go more by looks than anything. So as soon as that, the, the freshly cut hay gets that grayish look over the top, we're raking that stuff. And, and even by that time, it's, you're getting close to being behind because the leaves are going to start to, to shake loose just a little bit. In my opinion, the greatest benefit about hay in a day or, or where the greatest quality comes in is that you have the ability to save all those leaves. So when you start knocking leaves off, that's when you're. That's when you start losing the benefit of hay in a day. Aside from just having being able to do your hay all in one day, if they're calling for rain tomorrow. But as far as specifically ask your question, experience tells me from the past, from what I visually saw, and then doing the forage sampling, you know, later in the in the year, usually we're in that 65 at the highest. If you wait until you see that gray coating on top. And then you rake it and you bale it after that, providing you've got adequate sunshine. You're not going to be over 65%. A lot of times you're going to be, by, if, if, you, if you sort of uh, twiddle your thumbs a little bit too long right after you're done baling and, and the air is moving and the sunshine is there, you're probably going to be down in that 45% moisture by the time you've got that stuff in the bale. So, so I don't know if that answers the question or not, but 
a lot of times on average we're we're right at 50 or maybe just a tad bit under by the time it's all said and done do does your mower have conditioners on it or is it a sickle bar we do both. We we have the sickle bar mower, and then we use the the hay bind with the conditioners. We will um, take the pressure off the conditioner. We don't set the conditioner apart. We just take the pressure off the rollers. And you know, uh, Tom Kilser from New York, uh, and, and Eric, you, you maybe you can help me with this, but Tom Kilser is a guy that really. Uh, brought fire to the lion with this hay in a day stuff. And he was very adamant about absolutely no conditioning whatsoever. Here in our area, I really don't see that big of a difference between the sickle bar and the hay bind, providing that you lay that hay bind out as far as possible. And we're, I would hate to say that we're 90% of the, of the, as far as the hay bind is concerned, I don't know if we're at 90% of the cutter bar, but we're close. We're close. Maybe that 80, 80 to 90%. So, obviously, it depends. The first cutting, first cutting hay, we sort of steer away from hay in a day just simply because it's too thick. But once we get into the second cutting, um, the hay bind, it just, I think it dries about as fast. Just my opinion. And And we do... We do side by side comparison. I mean, we've got the same. We've got two pieces of equipment in the same exact field, and and so it's in the same field. And and you can really even just by raking it, I would almost venture to say that my hay bind is going to dry a little bit faster. Uh, then also on your your new seeding with the army worms, are you expecting that to survive? That's a good question. That's a good question. I can answer that better next uh, May. Um, I am under the opinion right now, I'm under the opinion that I think it will. Just simply because the stems are there, the roots are there, and, and it's, it's so like I said, there's six inches of stem there. And the roots are, I don't know how deep they are, but I would say you know they're established pretty good. So... I think it has a fighting chance. I really do. It doesn't, like I said, it, it looks awful. It looks like somebody forgot to, to plant. I mean, just looking at the field, it looks like a, like a, uh, a corn silage field that was disc down and that's it. That's what it looks like. It has some weeds in it. Uh, those, those little winter annual weeds that are just, the ground is, isn't solid green with those little, oh, in our area we have chickweed and there's another one like uh, purple tea nettle, I think they call it. It's got maybe two leaves on it, just a low-growing weed. Um, it doesn't look pretty. <laughs> and and talking to the seed people, they don't know either if it's going to survive or not. Speaking of army worms, I want to go back to Chris. What did you say you put on to, and they stopped it? It was a molasses mixture? Yes, it was. It was a foliar spray. It had a lot of molasses in it. Uh, it was called uh, Prime is what it's called and you, i've got it through uh sustain ag sustain seed and fertilizer is um who i got it through or it used to be center seeds but um yeah it, it seemed to have done well done real well so i also use the that foliar in uh our irrigation as well and uh i think it really helps out the microbes and and everything going on in the soil as well uh we put it in on our suction on our irrigation pump and uh, put it out on the field. You can definitely see where I put it and where I didn't put it. And i uh, been quite impressed with it. Well, the reason I ask is because I've been really curious about uh, if molasses or some sort of sugar-based foliar when armyworms, because I know, you know, I live in southern Michigan and Indiana. I know Marlon mentioned it that army worms have been an issue the last two years in that area and the problem with the normal treatment is i think you said chris you use some dipel and the problem with that is by the time it actually takes effect it's it's too late um so either you got to spend a bunch of money getting it on not knowing if there's a problem or you put it on late and waste a bunch of money because it's too late um but with it with there being a sugar aspect to the, you know, to the molasses or putting that down as a foliar, you know, most of those bugs, they can't, they can't digest sugar. They'll just, they'll, they'll 
basically ferment. <laughs> Their insides will ferment. Um, and I've wondered if that would work. So I, that's kind of encouraging to hear that, that that is something that worked for you. Yep, yep. It did work for us. And, I mean, I had the dipel was sitting here, and um, I wanted to just try it first. And so I did it, and it worked. And the the guys I bought the dipel from, they're kind of upset with me because I'm like, hey, I don't need it now. You know, and they're like, well, we had a special order for you. I'm like, I can't help it. I don't need it anymore. I just this is what we did. And he was like, that shouldn't work. I'm like, well, it did work. <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, it, you know, they're gone. So we're pretty happy about that. What, so what is in the be, foliar? It is, um, from what I understand that besides the molasses, it has a bunch of food waste products in it. So it's like they took a bunch of food waste and a com. I reckon you'd call it like compost tea, but it is made with food waste. Um, that's what I understand is in the stuff. And I got it approved through Oregon Teals and all. And, um, I, you know, um, the, the analysis is only like a 322, so it's pretty much like fish on the analysis. So I, I, my personal opinion, by a little bit that I gather, I think you could take fish, fish emulsion stuff, and put a bunch of molasses in it and spray it. I think it would work as well, in my own opinion. I think that we just need to stay on the ball. And, you know, uh, there were several folks, like I said earlier, several folks were having problems in their in their uh, fall, early planted small grains. It was mostly oats that they were having problems with. And, and um, I was out there just, I don't know, I think I was just walking by and I was like, that doesn't look look right. And started scratching the ground, started, got up there and started messing. And I could find them, you know, kind of scattered out across the field. And I kind of freaked out. So, um, cause I was scared to lose it. Cause we're, I mean, honestly, I'm going to be a little bit short on feed. So every little bit of feed that, uh, we can, we can keep and let the cows graze instead of letting a bug eat it. I was, uh, I was kind of a little upset that they were out there. So we were going, you know, put it out and see what happens. So been really, really happy with it. Yeah. I don't, I've never heard of anybody that was excited to see the army worms out there, Chris. So I don't think you're alone on that one. Yep. Yeah, we've lost uh, in years past. We had some, uh, man, this is several years ago, but we had wheat that was ready to graze, and it's way back in the back, and it was about ready to graze, and uh, we went to go graze it, and it was gone. <laughs> so they like pretty much ate the whole field, and uh, we were pretty upset about that. So I, I, I remember that. I, that was a long time ago. I was young, but yeah, I, you don't forget that. <laughs> Hey, I have a, a quick question on, on the uh, the army worm. That's something I'm totally unfamiliar with. What what is the range of the army worm? As far as is that prevalent in the whole Midwest and the South, or on the East Coast too? Well, I, I think I don't I don't really know about other parts of the country, but here um, it just seems like every fall there's you know somebody gets you know you hear hear of people having it uh last year per last year i don't believe we had them here on the farm i never i did not notice them but from what i gather it, it i think and i may be totally wrong but i've heard that they come up with the different um like tropical storms and stuff is what i've heard they fly in with those the malls but i don't i personally don't know much about it especially i don't know much about them in the midwest i would say here in ohio we probably have a little bit every year, and about every five years, it's bad. Yeah, this is Marlon, and I'm here in, in northern Indiana, basically the same climate as as Ohio, as Mike out in Ohio, and, and I would agree with Mike. I think that, so like like Chris was saying, I think that the 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 type of tropical storms and and the prevailing direction of the wind has something to do with it. But there's also, from my understanding, is that we have, in our area, these army worms go through um, cycles. And so they lay their eggs, and those eggs are there every spring to hatch. But if the conditions aren't good for them or perfect, would be closer to correct. If the conditions aren't perfect we don't really find out about army worms. But if conditions are correct at the correct time of the, of the year, 
they really flourish, and that's when we find out, and that's where that five-year thing comes in. Uh, 2012, we were blessed with them. Uh, we had a drought plus army worms, and then uh, last year, or this past year, 2021, but it was sporadic. Uh, some guys were, were hit pretty hard. Some of them weren't as hard. And then this is the first time that I know of that we've had the fall army worms. And I'm thinking the army worms that we experience in the early summer are different from the ones in the fall. Now, they act the same, but I'm thinking it's a different tribe. I, I don't know if that's correct or not, but I think it's a different type of... Um, for instance, the one sort of goes more for the the grass i think the the early summer ones will eat more of the grass and the ones in the fall will do more on the alfalfa if i'm not mistaken so i'm gonna go uh i want to ask each of you if if there is a, a certain goal or something you would like to try in 2022 um to see if there's something like that that's kind of on mm. your list of things to try next year so marla i'm going to start with you do you have anything like that on your list for next year we uh so so as far as as growing uh pasture or or growing feed or doing some with something with the cows not necessarily uh we i do have a short-term goal of getting some type of equipment shelter put up to where so so right now most of my summer equipment sits in a fence row during the summer. I mean, I, I have inside storage for the winter where we, we pretty much do a jigsaw puzzle where everything fits together and we pile stuff on top of each other. But once we're in summer mode, that stuff has to be on the outside in order to get to it. And you can just see yearly that that stuff, that equipment is just degrading just from the weather. And it looks, like I said, I've got this stuff parked on the fence row. It just looks like I'm ready for auction every day. Uh, it just looks ugly, in my opinion. There's weeds that grow up around it. You can't really control the weeds because you've got equipment sitting there. And so my goal is to somehow, some way, put some three-sided shelter together, maybe a thin, thin long shelter where I'm thinking 24 feet wide by 60, 70 feet long to where we can just back our equipment in there out of the, out of the elements um, that's sort of my goal. Here's here's the thing. Some of you may, that may not be a very big goal, but for myself, I am absolutely no carpenter. I have, I I struggle with getting two, two by fours to stick together. And so <laughs> I'm going to try to get some help around and, and see if I can't build something like that. Um, that's the short-term goal, goal, goal on the farm here. Um, and then I've got some long-term goals as well, but uh, that's, that's, that's for next year. In Ohio, we call that outstanding equipment. <laughs> that's that's what I've got. It's outstanding equipment. But, man, I just, you know, it's sort of interesting. <clears throat> when we started farming, uh, we just we took over. So this is my family farm. I'm third generation. And so we I just bought out Dad as far as the equipment and cows and so forth. And his line of equipment wasn't all that extensive it wasn't all that high dollar equipment and so most of it we were able to store inside um and and i do want to mention here all my hay equipment as far as a round baler and small square baler that stuff is on the inside year round it's 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 the other stuff the manure spreader the tillage equipment the hay bind and so forth gets put on the outside anyway so it wasn't a big deal when his stuff sat on the outside but as we progress and as we increased equipment values uh, I just I just see it happening. I mean, the stuff is just decaying sitting outside, and I think that eventually. So we did a lot of upgrading, and I can't afford to have that stuff sitting on the outside for extended periods of time. It's going to cost me a lot of money at some point. And my thinking is, I don't have a pencil. I didn't put a pencil to this, but my thinking is that with the high value of equipment that we now have on the farm, that machinery shed whatever it's going to look like is probably going to pay for itself just in in uh extended life of the equipment that we do have so and i just i just don't like the way it looks i mean just it looks horrible and it's it's not out by the road or anything but i have to look at it every time i go fetch the cows i walk past this auction line up and i was like seriously <laughs> so 
and I did not touch on this. So uh, just reiterating a little bit, we've had excellent growing conditions, and we are sitting on a pile of forage. Uh, we haven't tested it yet. We're, we're that's, that's forthcoming here in the next two weeks. But if if my hunch serves me correctly, I don't think I'm going to have to buy a bale of hay this year. And on any given year, we've been buying two semi loads, which you know we're looking at fifteen thousand dollars just there, just on those two, at least fifteen to twenty thousand. So my thinking right now is, you know, I think I'm going to be able to tack that fifteen grand right on the bottom line of my operation. I'm sort of excited about that. Um, so we're sitting pretty good. Uh, we still got a fair amount of turnips to graze. And um, so I'm expecting that we should be able to keep the cows out into Christmas, close to that area. And um, that's about, uh, we're just, I guess I'm sort of excited about heading into winter just from the way we're sitting on forages. And I know I, I've, I've, I've been hearing quite the opposite from a few of you other guys and my sympathy is with you. I, uh, I hate to rub salt into that wound, but uh, I guess it was our turn this year. Thanks, Marlon. Uh, let's go to Eric, New York. All right. So first, with uh, the goal for next year, um, my number one goal is to get up some perimeter fence around the farm. Um, as we set up fence this year, it was more temporary fence, and so we set it up, and I took it down and set it up around another paddock, uh, another big field, like 20 acre field this fall. So we're looking to try to do, um, a permanent perimeter fencing project, um, hopefully next year. And it, there'll be some sort of perimeter fence going in. I'm not sure how serious it's going to be. Um, that'll depend on <laughs> how the finances look coming into spring, but that's my, my number one goal. And then kind of a secondary goal. Um, I'm, just starting to learn more and more each year about growing organic corn and my cousin Jesse Byler came on this last year and he pretty much um I, I focus more on cows and keeping everything going around the farm and he kind of took the corn uh growing the corn under his uh his wing this last year and did a, just an excellent job and so one thing we're looking to try to do la next year um is do some possibly some interseeding because the way our season is, we have a short growing season. So to get our cover crops in and get them taken off in the fall is a challenge, especially like this year where we got our corn off so late. So we'd like to try to do some interseeding right after our last cultivation. So that's kind of a secondary goal. And Jesse kind of heads up, you know, a lot of the ideas there and even, you know, got another piece of equipment this year for cultivating. And so, um, but we're looking to do a little better job with that. He did a great job this year and that's just kind of another step to make it better. And then, okay, this looking towards this winter, um, like Marlon, I, I'm feeling really good about where feed inventories are. I've tested some of my corn silage, um, and the hay also, and in pretty good quality. Um, I think we should be able to hold decent milk production. For me, the thing that was hurting me this last year, was grain price. Uh, we had high grain price and then of course just conventional milk price. So we do have some snaplage to supplement uh, also. So that should help bring my grain cost down. And then just, you know, going from last year, having a drought year, um, sorry, two summers ago, summer of 2020, we had a, a real drought year and I wasn't running as many acres. So I had just under $50,000 of purchase forage costs and I shouldn't have to buy any forage this year. You know, it did cost more money to grow an extra 50 acres and, um, and also rent the land, but it, it, it shouldn't be up. shouldn't cost me, you know, I'll be in a lot better shape than that 50,000. So. Thanks, Eric. Uh, let's go to Corby in Wisconsin. Yeah. Um, I guess I have a lot of goals. Um, there's, um, I don't even know where to start, but just moving on to a new place. Um, like to, actually tomorrow we're doing a bunch of concrete grooving in the barn. Cause it's, it was just kind of like a skating rink in the barn. Um, the place has got so much potential, but it also is kind of a project. So I have a list of like a hundred things. There's some things I want to do in the parlor. Um, 
I think one of the main things for next spring is to get uh, water to out to all the pastures. He had an overhead water line everywhere, but hadn't used it in years. So we'll see how good a shape it is. And once we hook it up and got to get some troughs out there, because I think that's pretty key to production in the summer. Um, as far as cropping, I'd like to do some summer annuals. Um, he was the guy that was here was doing uh, sorghum, red clover, Italian ryegrass uh, mix that he was planting in I think early June or late May. Um, so we actually harvested that last week. Uh, that w- would have been a second cutting on that. So um, I don't know a lot about that kind of stuff. Um, it's not something we did um, back home. So. Um, yeah, there's just a huge learning curve and I'm looking forward to hopefully bringing some ideas from back there to here and then obviously learning a lot of new things. Um, actually the equipment shed thing is on my list too. I know we parked everything inside back home and there's nowhere to park anything here besides the baler over at the neighbor's place. So either renting something to park stuff in or putting something up at some point, but there's only so much money to go around at this point. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think that the elements have a huge effect on equipment, um, especially in Washington with the rain. The rain was just terrible on stuff. And I know one of our mechanics always said fuel pump, everything from fuel pumps to whatever, you know, they get moisture in them and you end up, been a lot more on repairs just from setting outside. Um, as far as uh, feed goes, I inherited quite a bit of feed. We haven't actually done an inventory on it yet, but I have to pay for it. So the guy here is working with me on as I sell feed back home, which there's not much of because we fed a lot of it. So it's great to have the feed all piled here. And the guy that's flexible working with me, that's the plus, but it it does have to be paid for. Um, So, and he was milking quite a few less cows than I was too. So he was milking around 60 cows. I'm at 80 now, but my goal is to be at about a hundred. And that's a challenge for me too. You know, I was milking a hundred cows there and now I'm at 80 here. Cause what we did was we dried off anybody within 90 days of dry off and threw them on the truck. So I've got a bunch of dry cows um, waiting to come fresh. And yeah, so got a huge pile of feed, guy willing to work with me. So that's the plus, but it does have to be paid for. Chris. Yes, sir. How's your inventory looking? My inventory is pretty short. Um, you know, we'll we'll be okay. We're still grazing a little bit here or there. Um, we've still got, I don't know, it's supposed to get kind of cold tonight. I think I heard 26. So this will be our first frost this year. Um, and heck, I, I, I love cold weather. Like, I like cold weather a whole lot more than the heat. And I look like a little Eskimo running around here today. I've got hoodies on and long johns and everything because I'm not used to it. It's just kind of like a shock to my system today. So... It's uh, winds blowing and it's supposed to get cold tonight, but you know it, it is that time of year. But um, inventory wise, as far as feed, yeah, I mean we we've got a little bit of stuff on hand. We've got a lot of you know like dry cow heifer hay. We're we're good on that. As far as milk cow feed, we are gonna have to buy some hay from um, through the feed pool uh, through the grower pool. Um, uh, Dustin has been working on that. Um, our problem with that is, is everything so far away, um, uh, trucking is brutal this year. It's almost as much as the hay. So, uh, but you know, it is what it is. We'll make do, uh, my number one goal in this coming up years is stay in business. That is number one, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, uh, you know, I've been, I bought the herd from my dad in 2000. We got married in 2003 and February and I bought her from my dad in, in November of 2003. And, um, you know, it's been up and down since then. Um, you know, I was like 20, 
24 when I bought a herd of cows. Um, I would not recommend, if anybody's listening, I would not recommend getting married and turn around buying a herd of cows. It's not good for your marriage. I'll just say it like that. Um, it kind of puts the uh, strain on it there at the beginning, but but it te- it teaches you a lot as well as far as, you know, we got to, how to get things done and all. But, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it has been challenging from day one as far as milking cows. And luckily we've been with Organic Valley since 07. It is very, it's been very good. Um, you know, it's uh, whenever things are such as they are like this year, as far as inventory on feed being short and all, you kind of start. And this year, this time of year for me personally, it, it makes it a little bit more like, why are we milking cows? Why aren't we grain farming? You know, you're talking 30 some dollars soybeans. And you're like, man, I can make a lot of money. But when spring gets here and things are growing and cows are milking well and we're cash flowing and making money, you know, it's a whole lot different ball game. So number one, I have to make it through winter and, and uh, wait till spring and very optimistic on spring. We're getting everything set up and everything's planted for the most part and uh, very optimistic um, or trying to be optimistic when it comes to that. Um, but, you know, we just have to make it go. Um, and, and also, like he was talking, uh, Phil was talking a minute ago about putting up buildings, and that's that's something that we are short of here as well. Um, we <laughs> In the wintertime, we got stuff stacked on top of, you know, equipment stacked on top of equipment pretty much in the sheds just trying to get out of the rain. But uh, it looks like a mess around here right now i still got equipment sitting out and we uh we've got hay on the ground today we're gonna go mow some out late mow, well we're gonna bail some alfalfa today and some we got some millet that we just mowed yesterday as well we're gonna bail it up and uh it's really good quality stuff but um i, don't, I think this is our eighth cutting of alfalfa so we're it, it you know some of the cuttings of summer have not been too good but we've done very well on our alfalfa this year but uh, but anyway, that's what we got. This is Marlon. I have a question for Chris. Eight cuttings of hay, is that normal? Uh, we're pushing it a little bit. We we normally do six or seven. We we cut her a little bit early this year. And, uh, yeah, this, this one, actually, we probably should leave it alone on this cutting we're making right now. But we need to feed, so we're gambling on it. But, yeah, we're, we're at six or seven most of the time. Yeah, on our alfalfa. Yeah, so, but you know we start we we make our first cutting uh, normally April fifteenth or so. That's our first cut, normal. Uh, so do you know offhand what what is the expected uh, tonnage uh, per acre? So for us, well, area, we're at that four to six tons. You're talking about yeah. So it's probably about the same. So summertime we get beat up pretty bad, unless we're uh-huh. dumping water on it. So the cuttings we make in the summer are just kind of, you know, cut it off and make a couple bales off the whole field. You know, uh, that's summertime cuttings. Um, but spring we do really well. And this cutting to this cutting we got out there now, it's not real big. Man, it's a nice looking out south. Um, it, I think it'll be really good hay. But uh, but yeah, it's that's we're pushing it. I would say, you know, it just depends on the year. But this year. Uh, we did put a lot of water on it this summer and that's, you know, we were pushing it and pushing like days on cuttings as well. We, instead of cutting it 30 days, a lot of, I think all of our cuttings this year were 25 to 28 days. So we're kind of cutting it a little bit shorter and it's gaining us a little bit of time, a little bit. Of, it gained us an extra cut this year. But what, but the other thing down here, there's only just a handful of people that grow alfalfa. Um, I know of, uh, one one large hay grower. Well, these are all conventional guys. One large hay grower and two dairies. That's all I know. They grow alfalfa besides us. So we're, you know, a lot of folks. I spoke with guys in Wisconsin, and they were talking about they had crop insurance for alfalfa. And I'm like, we don't, we can't get crop insurance. So I spoke to my crop guy, my insurance guy, and he's like, no, it's not a normal crop for our area, so we cannot get crop insurance on our alfalfa. So it's just a little bit different. Well, I, I want to take the, uh, this opportunity to thank all of you for taking the time out of your busy schedules this whole year uh, to do these updates. I really enjoyed it, uh, doing this every other month with you all. And, and 
understanding that you went from being wet in Eric's region to burning up on the West Coast. Um, but I, I really enjoyed it. And I just want to thank you all so much for uh, doing this for uh, Brian and I for the podcast. So thank you much. No problem. Thank you, Brian and, and Mike. Uh, we really do appreciate y'all doing what you guys do as far as getting the, getting the word out of us organic guys and all the stuff you guys do on that podcast. This episode was brought to you by Soil Biotics, providing full circle improvement for soil health and plant growth naturally.